Hi and welcome back to my channel. My name is Natalie from Living the Dream Permaculture. Today I wanted to talk to you about starting a food garden. Last year in March we saw a huge rush in panic buying where people realised that food security was really important. I put a poll on my Instagram page recently where 77% of people um, who responded agreed that they feel like another lockdown is fairly imminent here in Australia, especially in Victoria where we're seeing an increase in numbers. I'm not advocating panic buying at all. Um, we saw that happen last year in March and then again um, in the second lockdown. Clearing out the supermarket is detrimental to many people, people who are working at odd hours or are first responders or are elderly or are unwell and can't get to the shops or can't purchase online. And things that are usually staples in our pantry were really hard to come by. So for me, it was sugar and vinegar in the peak of my preserving season. Um, but other things like flour, pasta, rice, even things like washing soda where people thought about making their own cleaning products because they couldn't get um, laundry detergents or um, dishwashing powder or liquid or soap. So even um, cleaning items became really hard and scarce to get. Many people I've spoken to have said that food prices have increased but I don't shop regularly enough to really notice that um, increase in price. I think we can agree that COVID isn't going away anytime soon and things are getting pretty bad overseas. We try and stay off um, news sites and mainstream media, um, most media, even um, social media. Um, the only social media I have is my Instagram page and I've restricted that to gardening only. Um, so we're not getting bombarded with all these images, but we are seeing um, that there are cases overseas. And the fact is, is that we're coming out of summer and our summer isn't very warm anyway. And we're going to be heading into winter, which is where we see an increase in cold and flus anyway. Um, let alone with this disease going around. And I certainly don't agree with fear mongering. I'm not trying to fear monger anyone. Um, that's one of the main reasons why we don't do media is because we just can't handle the fear mongering that's out there. Last year we saw a huge increase in home gardeners, which was absolutely fantastic. That's probably the best thing that's come out of COVID. And I really want to encourage anyone who's not yet growing to start growing, at least start growing something in their garden. So I really wanted to share some tips with you on how you could start your own edible garden. Growing food quickly and maximising your space that you have. Not everyone is lucky enough to live on acreage. Not everyone is lucky enough to have a large backyard. But even with a small backyard, even with a balcony, you can start growing some of your own food. And lastly, I want to share an action plan so you can walk away from this video with helpful, useful steps in how you can start growing your own food today. Let's start with really fast growing crops. So when I have gaps in my garden, I like to plant out radishes because they are ready to be harvested from three to four weeks. So they are super, super quick. Things like lettuce should always be in your garden. Um, it is super easy to grow and you can cut and it will come again. And then if you plant successively every three and four, every three to four weeks, then you can stop the plant from becoming really bitter, which is what can happen with older plants or can happen in heat stress or water stress environments. So by continually sowing the seeds or letting it go to seed and self-seeding itself is a really great way to continually have that in your garden. Chinese broccoli, which you can see behind me here, is really quick growing, much quicker than regular broccoli. Um, regular broccoli can take between three, four or five months to head up and this Chinese broccoli can take uh, four to six weeks to start giving you shoots. So it's not a traditional broccoli where you get a head, it's a stem broccoli where you use the leaves, the stem and the tiny floret on top. Great in stir fries, um, great steamed, great, great added to soups as well. So it's really useful and versatile and um, something that you can plant in your garden to start getting a harvest now. Carrots, especially the smaller ones, are quick to produce, especially in the warmer uh, months that we're seeing now. Um, you can start seeing carrots between 50 and 60 days, which is really um, fantastic. Obviously, by starting a garden, you're not going to be reaping the re rewards straight away. But um, if you start planning for the future, um, you can ensure that you've got food through the winter months where things might get a little bit crazy again. Other things that you can grow that are really quick are things like spinach and turnips. 
zucchini, bush peas and bush beans. So they're faster to, to produce than the climbing variety and they take up less space as well. Baby beets, kale, cucumber, tatsoi and bok choy. Both the tatsoi and bok choy are really quick to produce as well. You can see food on your table from those plants between um, three to four weeks and the great thing about these plants is you could harvest the whole thing but if you just harvest leaves at a time then you can ensure that you have continual production so if you cut it all off then you won't get any more from that plant it's all gone it's spent but if you start harvesting leaves from the outside you can see continual production over a few weeks to a few months depending on your plant and the season and something that will give you food fairly quickly is sprouts so you can grow these on your windowsill you don't even need a garden for this so things like alfalfa or sunflower sprouts, pea shoots, um, mung beans or bean shoots are all fantastic and really quick crops. So if you really did need food soon, that's a great addition to your kitchen. Um, you can put them in stir fries, in soups, on top of salads, in sandwiches. Um, so that is something that just about anyone can do. You don't even ha need any skills for that. All you need to do is moisten your seeds and keep watering them daily and then you'll see the shoots starting to grow. I also love to fill my garden with garden staples. Things like a silver beet is always in my garden and herbs are always in my garden too. Things like garlic and perennial onions and leeks, rhubarb, scarlet runner beans, chives, asparagus, sorrel, wild rocket, cape gooseberries, pepinos. If you would like to find a complete guide to my 20 top permaculture plants or perennial plants that you could put in your garden, you can find the link here. The great thing about perennials is that you only need to plant them once and they're going to be forever in your garden, where annuals you have to continually keep sowing them, which is fine. I have a huge annual garden but I love having the perennials there because I know I've always got food growing and I don't need to worry about um, continually planting them. And a lot of people will be thinking, but I don't have a farm and I don't have a big space, but you can grow 150 kilos of food in just 40 square meters. So you could put four, what, um, so you could put four 10 meter beds that are one meter deep. So you don't need to keep walking on your garden. It's a double reach bed. Um, it's easy to weed and look and look after and you can be incredibly productive in such a small space. If I'm going to be honest, in this space here, this is where I produce the majority of my food, not only for me, but for my neighbours and my barter buddies. So you don't need a huge space, you just need really healthy soil which you can um, create by making your own compost um, and mulching. That is all you need for really healthy soil. In my suburban backyard, I grew in my front garden, so there's no reason why you can't utilize space like that yourself. I never had anything go missing, except for um, during the end of our six or seven year stay there, um, I noticed one cabbage and a couple of spring onions go missing, which for over a six year period isn't too bad, but you could fence it off if you were worried about food security. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we all utilize our space to grow food instead of relying on other people to do that? We should all be growing food instead of lawns. A lot of people say to me, but how do you manage to look after such a big space? I've got 750 square meters of annual beds. And the answer to that, and the answer to that is you don't need to spend much time in your garden. You can successfully garden if you dedicate 30 to 60 minutes a day and that's for such a large space that I've got. I've got a video on how I transformed my weed covered garden. I had over 350 square meters of weeds and I um, documented over the month um, what would happen if I spent only 30 minutes to 60 minutes a day in the garden transforming it into a productive area. So if you need some inspiration in how you can uh, manage your own garden, I'll link the video up here so you can watch what happened in my garden. If we all grew our own food, can you imagine what would happen? We would cut down on food miles. Food travels thousands of miles here in Australia. To eat strawberries during the winter months in Victoria, those strawberries need to travel thousands of miles from Queensland. 
I was speaking to someone yesterday in my Self-Sufficient Conversations podcast series. Um, that, one, that episode isn't out yet, but it will be out later in January. And she said to me that when she lived at the top of WA, that the mangoes were being exported all the way down to Perth, a couple of thousand kilometers, and then all the way back up after they've been packed back to the, the town that she was living in, which is just ridiculous. We could cut out on so many food miles and so much fossil fuel and CO2 emissions if we just grew some of our own food in our own back or front gardens. We would have free, organic, healthy, living food that we could eat and feed our families. We could sequester carbon in the soil, cutting down on global warming. We could encourage bees and pollinators instead of threatening them. And we would have food security, the most important thing of 2020 and 2021. This all sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But how do you make it happen and how do you make it happen now? I'm going to link a video on how I prep my garden beds. This is the easiest way that I prep my beds and anyone can do it. If you had grass, you would just lay newspaper or cardboard on top and start layering up the layers that I do. But because I've gotten rid of most of my grass um, in my garden beds, if you had a garden full of weeds, you could do the same thing. Don't weed, don't waste your time, don't, don't break your back. Just lay a cardboard and newspaper on top of the weeds and start your layers there. If you've got a garden bed that's just finished cropping, I'll do the same, just layer it up. So by layering I mean, first you put cardboard and newspaper down if you need it, and then your compost, and then your straw on top to make sure that all those microbes don't die and you retain as much moisture in your soil as possible. If my garden beds are doing really badly, I usually um, pile up my weeds so they can start breaking down and then um, I'll put that on and then, and then I'll put that on first and then I'll pop my compost and straw on top. And if it's really, really bad, I'll do those layers a couple of times over. And if I have a fallow area or something that I'm not planting in, say over winter, I'll sow a cover crop of peas or broad beans and in summer you could use beans you chop them down just before flowering and you lay them on top and then you can lay your compost and straw on top of that. Not only do they fix nitrogen, but they add, orga but they add organic matter back into your soil. So an action plan, how do you get started? Write a list of veggies that you eat regularly. There's no point in growing something that you don't eat or that you don't like. No matter how many Instagrammers are growing it and raving about it, if you don't like it, don't grow it. Purchase heirloom seeds so that you can keep saving your seeds and you don't need to keep relying on these seed companies to provide seeds for you. Keep it simple. You don't need all these varieties. Something that I've certainly failed at is keeping it simple. I love growing a huge variety of colors and shapes and sizes, but 2021 for me is simplifying what I grow in my garden. So. Summer 2021 and 2022 will see me growing one zucchini variety rather than the five that I'm growing now. Why? Well, because I can save the seeds and I can ensure that they're pure and they won't cross pollinate with all the other varieties. So next season I'll be growing Lebanese zucchinis only. I'll also be cutting down on my pumpkin varieties. This year I've got many varieties, too many to name, probably in excess of 10 varieties. And that's all great and wonderful come harvest time. I'll have shapes and sizes and different flavors and colors, um, but I can't save any of those seeds because they would have cross pollinated with all the other pumpkins and with my zucchini. And I won't get a fruit from those seeds that would be worth eating most of the time. So I've researched how I can grow two varieties and save the seeds from them and not have any cross pollination. So next year I'll be growing um, Queensland Blue and Butternut Pumpkins. They are in the same family but they have a different genus. So one is uh, Cucurbit Moscato and the other one is Cucurbit um, Maxima. Pretty sure I got that right. And the zucchini is Cucurbita Pepo. So while they're all in the um, Cucurbita family, they've got a different genus at the end of their Latin name or their botanical name. This is something I want to dive deeper into this year. I'm really dedicating so much time to learning about seed saving and I'll be sure to share much of that knowledge here once I feel confident and comfortable in that knowledge myself. 
the next thing that you need to do is start observing and researching. Usually in permaculture we say take 12 months to sit, watch and observe your land. But we don't have 12 months at the moment. We need to start growing food now. So a way that you can speed up this research and permaculture designers usually do this for the properties that they're designing for and it's something that I certainly do. It's using fantastic apps like Sun Calculator. So if I'm designing a property that's not in my state or not close by or not somewhere that I'm very knowledgeable in, say the other side of Victoria, I can sit down with the Sun Calculator app, figure out the changes in the sun position, which happens throughout the year. So the sun's much, much lower in winter, which means that you're going to cast much more shadows than you would in summer. Most of my areas here have full sun in summer and towards the end of this bed I get a little bit of shade in winter so it's not an area that I can grow productive things in um, through the winter months but I know that for my land and it's something that you should know for your land. So using things like sun calculators you can figure out which areas receive full sun and which areas might receive shade in winter and you can avoid growing in those areas or move your garden bed or create your garden beds in an area that will receive full sun because plants need sun to grow. That is the most important thing. They need six to eight hours of sunlight each day. The next thing is to draw a plan. Um, this can be as simple or as elaborate as you like. Try and draw your plan to scale. That way when you're filling in garden beds of what you want to plant when, you know how much space you can dedicate in each section for each type of veggies that you want to grow. Next, you need to research how much space everything needs to grow, and this can usually be found on your seed packets. At the back of my packet here, it tells me the height of the plant. These are carrots, so they grow to 25 centimeters tall, and they tell me the spacing, 10 centimeters apart. And every seed packet will have this information on it, and if it doesn't, you can go to the website you bought it from or you can just Google it and it will come up with the height and the spacing requirements that you need for that plant because overcrowding something means a reduction in yield. Um, I planted my leeks super, super close and what happened? They all bolted and they were pencil thin. But the leeks that I spread out, they grew really nice thick shanks and they didn't bolt for me. Next, you need to work out a plan for successive harvesting so you don't have 50 cabbages ready at once. Figure out what your family uses and work around this. For example, Black Beauty zucchinis and Lebanese zucchinis are much higher yielding than a golden zucchini. Or growing sprouting broccoli instead of big heading broccoli. Sprouting broccoli will give you a yield over a much longer period of time and if you cut it off at the base, leaving about 5 to 10 centimetres above the ground, your plant will reshoot and regrow instead of like traditional broccoli where you have one head that you can harvest and you get a few more side shoots. Sprouting broccoli is much more higher yielding than heading broccoli. In small gardens, you should really start making use of vertical spaces. So you can put arches like this in between your garden beds over your walkways and you can grow abundant things like tromboncinos, which are very vigorous and very high yielding. The great thing about tromboncino is you can pick them small like this and use them like a zucchini. You can let them get much bigger and use them like many big zucchinis or you can let them ripen and they'll turn a beautiful golden shade, kind of like this flower here, like a light orange, yellowy color. And that way you can store them for use during the winter months. And they can stay on your shelf for as long as six to 12 months. So you can grow food in your warmer months when things are growing much more vigorously and you can save them to grow, to eat through winter when your garden isn't as productive. Another great crop to grow up your arches would be cucumbers, beans, and even tomatoes. I've been seeing people training their tomatoes up these trellises, up these archways, making the most use of their space and being incredibly productive even in a backyard setting. And lastly, don't be afraid to grow in pots, especially if you're in a rental. I have a friend in a rental who has, who has the most productive 
garden and she's growing in regular pots. What she did was made sure that her soil was really fertile using lots of compost and she keeps them well watered and she's growing beans and zucchinis and eggplants, tomatoes and um, cucumbers and capsicums in these pots. Here I have turmeric in pots. I find that it grows much better here on my climate because it is a little bit cooler. Um, I can keep them warmer, I can move them away from frost and I can keep them well watered. So even if you're in a rental, you can still grow food. You just need to think outside the square a little bit. If you would like more helpful tips like, like what to sow when and successive plantings, you can find this in my ebook, which I have linked down below. I hope you found this video helpful so you can start growing your own food and ditching the supermarket. Bye.